Good morning, church. Good morning, all of you who are joining us today, friends and family, and all over the world, literally all over the world, people tuning in today. We want to uh, welcome you and and, uh, say how glad we are that you're joining us today. I love that song that Mark chose uh, leading into the message today, Waymaker. Jesus has an advantage in terms of being the way maker because Jesus is the way. And he's not just pointing the way. He's not just saying, come and let's find the way. Jesus is the way. And I, uh, and I hope that you're going to be reminded of that this morning. And I hope that you're going to be encouraged uh, in that this morning as we continue in our series, Impossible. Living the Witness Life, we are in session three today, and I want to tell you a story, a story that uh, is born out of the life of C.S. Lewis, C.S. Lewis who wrote the Chronicles of Narnia, seven great uh, books that he put together for a child, but it's not really children's material. It is unbelievable imagination from Lewis. They once asked him, how did you write this? And he said, what I did was I saw this story happening in my mind, and then I went and I wrote what I saw. And uh, most people are familiar with The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. Walt Disney has done three of the, of the stories, and then they stopped. But I heard recently that Netflix is picking this up, and they're going to finish the series, um, and they're going to do a great job, which means that they're going to get to the book that many people think in the series is the best book of all of them, and it's called The Horse and His Boy. The Horse and His Boy, it's a story of Shasta and uh, his uh, horse, Bree, as they are traveling to find Narnia. And (coughs) Shasta has been on a long, exhausting, terrifying trip. He comes to a point where he is tired. He has nothing left. Nothing left. No energy left. And he just sits down and begins to cry. Let me pick up the story and how Lewis tells this. He says, what put a stop to all of this was a sudden fright. Shasta discovered that someone or something was walking beside him. It was pitch dark, and he could see nothing. And the, and the thing or person was going so quietly that he could hardly hear any footsteps. What Lewis goes on to say is that really what he picked up was the, the hearing of someone or something breathing, taking deep breaths. And he realized that the creature walking along beside him must have been very big. He said, the thing, unless it was a person, went on beside him so quietly that Shasta began to hope that he had only imagined it. But he realized he wasn't imagining it. Anyway, he had felt the hot breath of that sigh on his chilly left hand. If the horse had been any good, or if he had figured out a way that he could get any good out of the horse, he would have taken off and galloped and tried to get away. But he realized he couldn't. So finally Shasta gets to a point, and he says, Who are you? And from the darkness he hears, One who has waited long for you to speak, said the thing. Its voice was not loud, but very large and deep. Are are you a ghost, asked Shasta? You might call me a giant, but I'm not like the creatures you call giants. I can't see you at all, said Shasta, after staring very hard. Once more, he felt a warm breath of the thing on his hand and face. There he said, 
that's not the breath of a ghost. Tell me your sorrows. Have you ever wanted somebody to ask you that? Tell me your sorrows. And Shasta was a little reassured by the breath, so he told him that he had never known his real father or mother, been brought up sternly by a fisherman. Then he told of the story of his escape and how they were chased by lions and forced to swim for their lives and that all their dangers in this scary place and about the night where in the tombs and amongst the dead and the beasts howled at him from the desert. And he told him about the, the heat and the thirst of the desert journey and how they almost at their goal when another lion chased them and wounded Erebus, which was his friend, and also how very long it had been since he had had anything to eat. And then the voice said, I do not call you unfortunate. Don't you think it was bad luck to meet so many lions? Said Shasta. There was only one lion, said the voice. What on earth do you mean? I just told you that there was two lions on the first night. There was only one, said the voice, but he was swift of foot. How do you know I was the lion? And as Shasta gaped with open mouth and said nothing, the voice continued. I was the lion who forced you to join with Erebus. I was the cat who con comforted you among the houses of the dead. I was the lion who drove the jackals from you as you slept. I was the lion who gave the horses the new strength of fear for the last mile so that you could reach King Loon in time. And I was the lion you do not remember who pushed the boat in which you lay a child near death so that it came to the shore where a man sat, wakeful at midnight, to receive you. Then it was you that wounded Erebus. It was I. But what for? Child, said the voice, I am telling you your story. Not hers. I tell no one anyone's story but his own. That is one of the great, greatest scenes in all of Narnia. I am telling you your story, not hers. I tell no one any story but his own. We so often want to know about things that happen to other people. We so often compare our lives to others that we forget that we have a story that's going on and it's the only story that we are writing. It's the only story that we are always in every scene. It is our story. And God wants us to live our story authentically. In this series, we have been talking about what it means to share the story. The story where our stories intersect with the story of life. The Jesus narrative, the Jesus story. And we talked about that we pray for people that we come in contact with, or we pray for family members or neighbors or friends or co-workers that have never intersected with that story and then we care for them and then we share with them and we hang in there with them. Jesus had an incident that's recorded in Luke chapter 8. When he's traveling, he comes upon a scene, a man that is literally in chains. He's in chains because he is stark, crazy, mad. He is consumed by so many demons 
that when Jesus asked for the name, the name that's given is Legion. And Jesus drives out the demons. And if you know the story, he drives them out and sends them into a herd of pigs. And they then go mad themselves and rush over a cliff and fall into the sea and have committed suicide. Okay, that's a bad joke. But the man then is in his right mind and the crowd, the entire village comes around and they see him in his right mind, but they're not concerned about him being in his right mind. They're concerned about the fact that they've lost their livelihood, which is raising pigs. Now, it's a really good question to ask, what are Jews raising pigs for? But when Jesus tells this, he says, later a great many people from Gerasen countryside got together and asked Jesus to leave. Too much change, too fast, and they were scared. So Jesus got back in the boat and set off. And the man who had been delivered from the demons asked to go with him, but he sent him back saying, go home and tell everything God did in you. So he went back and preached all over town everything that Jesus had done in him. Tell them everything that God has done in you. You know, we have this sense about evangelism or this sense about telling the Jesus story that it's only for professionals. We don't know enough. We can't tell the story. All Jesus is asking us to do is the same thing that he asked this man. Go tell everything that God did in you. So today, as we come around this model, we have talked about prayer and care last week. We're talking about sharing this week. And I want to give you four simple tips as we go into this. The, and I want you to remember what our definition of, of evangelism is. Evangelism is cooperating with God and others to lovingly, one step at a time, Bring someone one step closer to Jesus. Cooperating with God and others to bring, to lovingly, one step at a time, bring someone one step closer to Jesus. You can do this, you know, four simple ways. One, listen. Listen with your eyes. Listen with your ears. And listen with your extra senses. Last Tuesday night, we got a great example of this from um, Alex Absalom as he was taking us through the missional um, foundation course. Alex talked about being in line at a grocery store and seeing the clerk had a wrap on her hand. And Alex was paying attention to what the Spirit was saying to him. And so as he got close to her, he said to her simply, he says, you know, I think that Jesus wants to heal you. Can I pray for you? And she said, oh, please do. And he saw the manager coming closer to where the lady was working, and he felt like he had to, had to get the prayer in before the manager got there. It was like a 20-second prayer. Please, Jesus, Touched this lady, called her by name. Would you, would you please uh, heal her hand? Uh, amen. He said he did it three seconds before the manager got up there. And uh, that was the encounter. Except the next day he had to go back to the grocery store and lo and behold there was a lady without anything on her wrist waving, Alex, Alex, look. God healed my wrist. Listen. 
Pay attention to what's going on around you. Secondly, learn about the other person. So often when it comes to witnessing, people make, Christians make targets of other people instead of making friends. Instead of really connecting with people, instead of really getting to know who they are and being concerned about them. The third step is to ask great questions. You know, we spend so much time telling people instead of asking people. My wife has spent most of her adult life in the corporate world. She feels very comfortable in the corporate world, and she feels her mission field is in the corporate world. And, <clears throat> But she will tell you that she said, I don't, really know how to ask questions. I don't know how to bring up spiritual conversations, but she does it better than anybody I know. Let me give you an example. Jody was back in New York uh, with one of our cl corporate clients. She met a guy by the name of Mark, and Mark um, was having quite a year. He had sold his company after moving it twice, the first time was a move uh, of opportunity. The second time, Hurricane Sandy hit New York. The third move was because he had sold his company to our client uh, on the West Coast that wanted an East Coast presence, but he had agreed to stay on for two years. During all of this, uh, he kissed his wife goodnight one evening and he went to sleep and he woke up the next morning and found her dead beside him. She had passed away in the middle of the night leaving him as a single parent losing the love of his life with two little girls. And Jody really felt for Mark the morning she was leaving, she found that she and Mark were by themselves in his office. And so she asked this question, hoping to spark a spiritual conversation. She said, Mark, how does your faith help you navigate times like this? And Mark lowered his head, and when he looked up, he had tears coming and running down his cheeks. And he said, Jody, I am so angry with God. You would think that would have been a great conversation, except they got interrupted and Jody was taken uh, to the airport. And she didn't have any contact with Mark for over a month, and uh, she was really looking forward to go back there to pick up on that conversation. But when she got there, Mark was completely different. He was lighthearted. She could see that whatever the burden was, that somewhat had been lifted from him. And so they had another moment where they were alone and she said Mark she said you look so much different than the last time I was here and he said oh Jody he said I got to tell you your question allowed me to express my anger with God and when I opened up with that I was able to find my way back to God one simple question ask great questions. Then the last one is ask the greatest question, the best question. Can I pray for you? What is magical about that question, can I pray for you, is that it points people not towards us, but it points people towards Jesus. When people let us pray for them, do you really believe Jesus is going to answer that prayer? 
It's not about us, it's about Him. He is the way maker. He is the way. And when we pray for people, and then they see Jesus answer that prayer, they find a way to Him. One last illustration. You see this group of people sitting in the back. This picture obviously was taken before shelter in place because none of them have masks on. But it represents something that is happening in the life of one of our clients and good friends. I'll just tell you her first name. Her name is Jill. And Jill had a tragedy like Mark. She lost the love of her life. Her husband Tripp passed away from health complications. But less than two weeks before Tripp left this life, he found his way into a relationship with Jesus. And people really miss Tripp. To this day, they miss him. And Jill is one of those people that is so much fun to be around and so encouraging. And they wanted to be around Jill, so she started doing a gathering at her house that's now been going on for three years. They get together once a month, and everybody in this group, almost, don't know Jesus yet. But they wanted to gather around and talk about these things that Tripp was beginning to talk about within the last two weeks of his life. So they gather, and they pick a word, and everybody t sits around and shares what that word means to them. And then, Jill will pull out a Bible, several Bibles, and pass them out. She teaches them how to find that word in a concordance, and teaches them how to look up those verses in Scripture, and then they begin to read what the Bible says about those words. Words like, like glory, and heaven, and joy, and sorrow. And this has been going on for about three years, and they uh, called it for a long time, Trips Trippin'. And uh, one of the guys who when he first started coming was probably the guy furthest away from God. And he goes, you know, I hate that word, trip, tripping. And, and Jill said, well, you know, this is kind of like I call it my Jesus circle. And the guy goes, that's what it is. Let's call it the Jesus circle from now on. You know what's wonderful about this is that Jill's doing a missional community and she doesn't even know what a missional community is. So when you have the opportunity... How do you share? Well, I think the beauty of this is found in Paul's life. The Apostle Paul often found himself in trouble and often found himself in trials. And he finds himself in the city of Caesarea where the Jews now who see him spreading the gospel amongst Gentiles, put him on trial. And they finally bring him in front of the king of Judea, the great-grandson of Herod the Great, Herod Agrippa. And he's going to have to testify. And when he does... And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you the abbreviated version of this. When he does, Paul talks about his life before he met Jesus. Because Grippa brings him up to put him on trial and says, go ahead, tell us about yourself. So Paul took the sand and told his story. His story. He starts, from the time of my youth, my life has been lived among my own people in Jerusalem. And he tells what it was like before he knew Jesus. He talks about his viciousness 
towards people who followed Jesus. He talks about having them arrested. He talks about the opportunity to cast his vote for their execution. He talks about the fact that he was on the way to Damascus to continue this persecution when suddenly something happened. He said, one day on my way to Damascus, armed as always with papers from the high priest authorizing my actions, right in the middle of the day, a blaze of light, light outshining the sun, poured out of the sky on me and my companions. And he talks about what happened. And he talks about the fact that he came to a defining moment. And Jesus says, I mean, Paul says, who are you, Master? And he said, I heard a voice. I am Jesus, the one you are hunting down like an animal. But now, on your feet, I have a job for you. I've handpicked you to be a servant and witness to what's happening today and what I'm going to show you. He says to King Agrippa, what could I do, king? I couldn't just walk away from a vision like that. I became an obedient believer on the spot. And then, right after that, he goes on to tell Agrippa, I started preaching this life change, this radical turn to God, and everything it meant in everyday life, right there in Damascus, right on to Jerusalem and the surrounding countryside, and from there to the whole world. And it's because I'm preaching to the whole world that I'm standing before you on trial now. And Agrippa answered him and he said, if you keep this up much longer, you'll make a Christian out of me. And Paul, still in chains, said, that's what I'm praying for. Whether now or later, not only you, but everyone listening today to become like me, except, of course, for this prison jewelry, these chains. You see, again, we make this witnessing so difficult. I've got to know all these programs. I've got to be armed with tracks. I've got to have all of this. Paul just told Agrippa his story. This is what I was like before I met Jesus. This is how I met Jesus. This is what I was like after. You can do that. You could do it right now. And with more and more practice, you could get even better at it. I'd like to tell you one last story as we conclude. You see to the, the left on the slide that restaurant. You recognize it, right? I would fathom that every single one of us has had the opportunity to dine at a Denny's at some time in his or her life. When I was in college, there was a, a Denny's on Contra Costa Boulevard in Pleasant Hill that we often gathered at after I, I had a job when, when I was going to Berkeley in Pleasant Hill. And a lot of us would gather late at night. That's where I learned how to drink coffee was at Denny's restaurant. It was a place where a lot of us would gather. We would pull out our New Testaments and we would talk about passages that we were reading and say, what do you think this means? What do you think this is? What, what does this have to do with our life? And it's a place that we would often gather. And it's a place that we lived out over and over again, this verse that is up there, but in your hearts revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. And do it with gentleness and respect. Well, I was working with high school kids. And one of the high school kids, his name was Ron. Ron was in love with his girlfriend. 
and they were inseparable. And Ron was very active in our youth group, both of them were. And then suddenly they quit attending, didn't understand, until Ron came in to see me one day to tell me that uh, somebody had been going around in their neighborhood. Uh, he had knocked on Ron's door. Ron let him in. And Ron said, he showed me all the flaws in what I believed and that I have become a Jehovah's Witness. And uh, it broke my heart. I believe people that uh, follow the way of the Je Jehovah's Witnesses are, are zealous and passionate, but misguided. And uh, Ron kept trying to persuade me, so finally I said to him, I, I said, I tell you what, let's get together, you and your mentor, and myself and one of my roommates, Kevin. I said, let's get the four of us to talk. But when we talk, here's the agreement. The agreement is going to be that we're not going to argue. The agreement is, is that we're going to talk about just one thing, how we can be certain that we have eternal life with Jesus. If you'll set that up, let's meet at Denny's and we'll talk. So finally they agreed. We sat down and uh, the guy started and I said, uh, let me just go over the ground rules. We're not going to argue. We're not going to get into an argument. If we do, we're, it's over. We'll finish. I said, but I only wanted to discuss one question. How can you be certain that you have eternal life? As you're listening from the comfort of your home or wherever you're listening to this message, let me ask you that question. How can you be certain that you have eternal life? So the guy looked at Kevin and I and said, okay, but can we do some housekeeping items first? And I said, like what? And he goes, well, let me just ask you, do you believe in six-day creation? And I said, well, it depends. I said, you know, six-day creation has always confused me because I don't know why it took God so long. He said, okay, I'll take that as a yes, one for you, one for us. Do you believe Adam and Eve were real? And I said, yes. And he goes, okay, two for you, two for us. And he said, uh, what about Jonah? Do you think he was swallowed by a, a big fish? And I said, okay, wh what are we talking about here? And he goes, okay, well, Christmas time. Do you have a Christmas tree? I said, what? Well, do you have a Christmas? Do you say the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag? And I said, you know, right now you're trying to figure out all the differences we have. I, I think you're confusing the issues. At that moment, a friend of Kevin's and mine, his name was Ralph, saw us at Denny's and came over, hey, Kevin, Roger, what are you guys doing? And the guy saw him enter into the picture and he said, oh, come and join us. It's the last thing I wanted to have happen. Ralph was a guy that we had met a couple of months before that. We had had about three very casual conversations with him about Jesus, um, sitting in Denny's, sipping coffee or drinking Cokes, and uh, Ralph had not yet given his life to Christ, and I did not want him to sit down in what was going to appear to be an argument. I didn't want that to happen, but the guy had included him. And suddenly he turns to him and he says, what about you at Christmas time? Do you have a Christmas tree? And they went on to this discussion, and finally, after about five minutes, I said, can we, can we stop? Remember, the conversation that we're having is how can we be certain that we have eternal life? How can you be certain that you have eternal life? And he goes, you can't. And I said, yes, you can. He said, you can't. It depends on how good you are and how you live your life. And I said, then tell me why 
the Apostle John says in his first letter, this is the testimony that we have eternal life. And this life is in the Son. He who has the Son has life. He who has not the Son does not have life. I write these things to you so that you may know you have eternal life. 1 John chapter 5. I write these things so that you may know that you have eternal life. And he said no, and he held up his Bible and he said, there's so many things to learn in here, so many things you have to do. And so I wanted to point to Jesus, because that's what witnessing is, is pointing to Jesus. And so I did this. I said, let me just quote this verse out of John chapter 5. And I'm going to quote it from the, the way that I memorized it. You search these scriptures diligently because you think in them you have eternal life. This is Jesus speaking. He said, but these scriptures point to me and you refuse to come to me so that I can give you this life everlasting. Did you see that? Eternal life isn't in this book. This book points to he who has eternal life. It points to Jesus. I said, that's how you can know you have eternal life. If you, if you have the Son, you have life. And this Jehovah's Witness mentor looked at Ron and said, we're done. He closed his Bible and said, we're done. And he got up to leave. And I felt like, oh no, what impression is this going to leave with Ralph? And I felt like what I was worried about happening had happened. And at that point, Ralph looked at Kevin and I and said, hey guys, can you stick around for a moment? And I thought, well, I've got to do cleanup work now. And I said, sure. And he said, boy, that guy's pretty impressive. But he can't see the forest for the trees. He can't see the forest for the trees. But you know what? What you're talking about in terms of eternal life, I want that. How can I have that life? And so, we went out into the parking lot and Kevin and I had the privilege of being able to lead Ralph in a prayer. And that prayer went something like this. Dear Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for me and the forgiveness of my sins. Right now, I ask you to come into my life and be my Lord and Savior. If you've been listening to this last part of the message and you're going, I want to know that I have eternal life, you can know it right now by praying that prayer with me, sincerely talking to Jesus, not to me, to him. Just repeat after me, sincerely with everything you have. Dear Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for me. Right now, Lord, I open my heart and I receive you as my Lord and Savior. I will follow you. And I believe that according to Scripture, if you prayed that prayer sincerely, 
you now have the Son of God living inside of you. He who has the Son has life. I write these things to you, John says, so that you may know you have eternal life.